Hello and welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson and B.J. Clark is with me today as always. We appreciate so much the opportunity to study with you. Today we're going to continue a study that we began last week, Prove All Things by the Bible. Please stay tuned. B.J., great to be with you today. Yes, sir. Good to be with you, brother. B.J., as we get back to what we were talking about in a previous program, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's a need to prove everything that we practice, mm -hmm. spiritually speaking, by the Bible. That is the divine standard. And that message has not changed. You know, the psalmist said, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So we're not talking about a message that is changing with with the tides, but rather this message is this message is timeless. So there are a lot of things in the religious world that people practice that quite frankly aren't found in Scripture. Mm -hmm. One of the passages you alluded to earlier in our study, First Peter chapter four, verse eleven, where Peter said, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. BJ when I think about the church, you know, the Bible says there's one head and there is one body. That's what Paul Paul makes that case in Colossians 1.18, for example. And yet, when I look at the religious world, there are some who would say, well, you know, we need a head of the church here on earth because Christ is in heaven. So we got to have somebody that can regulate the affairs of the church, the bylaws of the church right here. So how do you counter that with the Bible? You know, one of the first things I'd like to say is that you mentioned a moment ago something about how this book is our standard and it's timeless. If you use a modern day GPS system, I can promise you this, they even have software that comes in the box with a cord that you can connect to a computer and download the map updates that are coming in the future because the roads that are today, some of them will be closed in sure. time to come. Some will be open that are not currently listed on the maps. And so the, the roadmap that you and I follow in daily travel is constantly changing, and we have to update our maps. What I love about this GPS system, there's no need to update it. There's no place to go and plug it in and say, okay, what's the latest view on church organization. And so I know this, the same pattern that God gave here is the same proof by which I'm determined today what God's method of church organization is. Let me give an example. In Acts 14, 23, God ordained that elders, plural, should be appointed in every church. Now that's a key. So that's not a board of deacons running the church, though there are deacons in the Lord's church. According to Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, we see the elders or bishops, as they're also called, with the deacons, the evangelists. But God's organizational system hasn't changed. He wants a plurality of qualified elders. Their qualifications are listed in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, Titus 1, 5 to 9. Get some men, a plurality of men that meet this criteria, and let them shepherd the church under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, 1 Peter chapter 5. He's the head of the church, and the elders have the responsibility to honor the head. And if they lead, we are to obey those who have the rule over us, according to Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. The elders have the right to govern us by this book right here as their platform and to follow the chief shepherd. So to answer your question, if people are struggling with what to do when it comes to the head of the church. They don't have to look to Rome for a papa. They don't have to look to some Episcopalian form of government or Presbyterian form of government per se as defined by modern day denominations. They just have to go to the New Testament and follow its wisdom in the way God set up the church. Yeah, you know, and BJ, we, we talk about the universal church, the one head, the one body. Uh, again, Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body, which or head of the church, which is a body. Christ is that one head. Now, there are those in the Catholic Church who espouse the idea that Peter was the first pope and that Christ built the church upon Peter. Now, language-wise, there are 
some similarities between the word Peter, the name Peter, and the word rock. But the foundation upon which Christ built the church was that bedrock statement that he had made earlier when he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was making an absolute affirmation of divine truth that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Now, in verse 18, Jesus said, I also say to you that you're Peter. That word Peter is masculine right. in gender, and uh, it, it means a small stone, a pebble. Right. But he said, you're Peter upon this rock. That's feminine, mm -hmm. and it really carries the idea of a large stone, a mammoth stone, a ledge, if you please. And based upon that bedrock statement you made, I'm going to build the church. Now, the Bible's its own best commentary. There you go. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So how do you counter those who want to say, well, but, you know. Well, the problem is we don't have the right to say, not so, Lord, to the Lord. <laughs> you know, Peter himself got in trouble at Acts 10 when he said, not so, Lord. <laughs> Well, wait, Peter, if he's Lord, you don't say not so to him about right. what he's telling you to do. And if the Lord says, this is my system of organization, and I don't find archbishops, and I don't find cardinals, and I don't find any bishop over a district of churches or over one church, if I don't find that in here... Oh, what is it we're saying? Prove all things? Yes. If I don't find that in here, then I can't prove that that is... Uh, what God would want done. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God in relationship to the organization of the church. My mother, I'm just being honest here, had me christened in the Roman Catholic Church as a little baby. I was named Bradley Joseph in part in honor of St. Joseph. And my mother made a change later on in life and became a member of the church that started in Acts 2, the church that you read about in the New Testament. And I asked her one time, I said, Mom, what made you change? And she said, Son, I learned that all the things that I thought must be in the New Testament, like holy water and rosary beads and certain things about, you know, Hail Marys and all these things that I'd been told, I just assumed were in there. But she said, when I started reading my New Testament, and notice there was never a mention of an archbishop or a cardinal or a pope or any of these other doctrines, I suddenly realized that I wasn't really trusting in the inspired word of God as much as I was the doctrines and commandments of men. And so she made a choice to leave that which was not being done by authority and to follow the simple New Testament pattern of organization which makes perfect sense to the Bible. By the way, Mike, if, if God puts a plurality of men over a congregation and one man goes astray, then the plurality helps the church not to follow that one man. And that's God's wisdom. You don't go to the oil fields in Texas and see everything in one big container. It's divided into all kinds of different containers. Windows are paned off and sectioned off so that if you break it, the whole thing isn't broken. God is so, he's so superior to us in yeah. his planning. Yeah, and you know, B.J., you talk about, you, you mentioned, we talk about the, the universal church, the local church. In, in, in Scripture, we can read of churches that are located in a certain geographical location, like the churches of Galatia, the churches of Asia Minor in chapters mm -hmm. 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. You read about, as you appeal to Philippians chapter 1, the church at Philippi, the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae. But elders plural, mm -hmm. governed those individual congregations. They have to meet the criterion laid down in Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. Now, if they meet that criterion, then their authority rests in matters of expediency. They don't have the authority to make new law. No. Uh, they don't have that right. But they do have the right, the authority to uphold Scripture and then to right. execute the work of the church in a local setting. And not one of those elders has any more authority than the other duly appointed elders so that one man can't run the church. If one man becomes morally or doctrinally contaminated and he's running the church, then the whole church is affected by that. Right. But in God's wisdom, one man could go astray and the others could say, nope, we're not going down that path. This is wrong. 
But you know what started happening in history? Unfortunately, these churches with their plurality of elders started having one man kind of become more like the chief elder. And then this church over here, they had their elder that was really kind of above the other elders. And pretty soon you've got all these different congregations with all these different elders being the chief. And then someone got the not so bright idea to have a meeting of elders from all the different churches and one man would go and represent that eldership. Now, every one of those elders that went to those conferences and conventions and meetings was used to being the one in charge back home. So what do you think happened when you get that many men together who are used to being the number one person in charge? There was a power struggle, and pretty soon the chief elder of the chiefs began to elevate himself, and by the time you get to some centuries later, about 434 A.D., you've got an individual by the name of Pope Leo uh, ba ba uh, Leo basically claiming to be the first pope. But you don't ever see that. Someone says, no, Peter was the first pope. He didn't act like it. No. He was an apostle. He was an elder. But he never called himself that. No apostle ever called himself that. Paul withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And Peter told a man that bowed down to him, get up. I'm just a man. Acts 10, 25 and 26. Don't say that happening today. Yeah. At all. No, you don't. BJ, when we emphasize proving all things in the denominational world, it's typical to have a board of deacons, as you noted a moment ago, with a one man pastoral system. Yeah. But again, that doesn't meet the litmus test of truth. When we look at the standard, you looked at Acts chapter 14, verse 23, they ordained elders in every church. Titus 1, Paul said to Titus to set things in order, and to ordain elders in every city and every church. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and this, there was no s system whereby one man would be the bishop over a large metropolitan area. And unfortunately, the more that that happened, the further and further away we got from the pattern of the New Testament. Fortunately, we can get back to speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where the Bible is <laughs> silent. That's what the restoration movement's all about. And if we go back to that, then yes, there will be pastors, plural, but there won't be a single pastor over a congregation such as we're so used to hearing. Uh, the Bible teaches that Peter was a pastor, but not because he was a preacher, but because he was an elder. If Acts chapter 20 is used, you can go to verse 17, he calls them elders. Greek word used there is a form of presbyteros. Later in Acts chapter 20, he tells that same group, he calls them overseers from episkopos, the idea of they were being overseers to rule. And then he calls that same group shepherds in the same context from a, a word that has to do with feeding a flock. And so God's system, and by the way, to prove that elders only have authority over the local flock, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 says, you tend the flock that is among you. Feed the flock of God which is among you. That means they don't have any jurisdiction over a flock that is somewhere else. Right. Those elders in that flock have the jurisdiction under the chief shepherd who's over all shepherds. That's right. And you know, BJ, one of the things I think that even as we explore this particular concept, elders don't have the right no. Uh, no eldership has the right to sit down and to re-examine certain biblical topics and then come to a conclusion that differs from Scripture and say, okay, we're going to do this. For example, we don't have the right, elders don't have the right to bring an instrument into the worship service. Right. They don't have the right to begin ordaining women elders in the Lord's church or using women to preach and teach in settings where men are present, because Paul forbids that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I heard a man some years ago, and you probably heard the same statement, make a statement that if someone tried to bring in instruments of music, if the elders tried to do that, he wouldn't run roughshod over the authority of the elders and oppose this, even though he didn't think it was the right thing to do. His mistake was to suggest that elders have authority 
to do something that the chief shepherd did not authorize them to do. If the chief shepherd says, baptism's for the remission of sins, what, what should every shepherd and elder say? Uphold that. That, mm -hmm. that is, I honor the chief shepherd. Otherwise, you talk about arrogance. Right. To, for me to say, no, 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 you're wrong about that. Uh, we say this. Well, who do you think you are to say something to the head? I can guarantee you my hand is moving right now because the head is leading and guiding and governing its movement. It's not the other way around. Exactly right. And that's what we need to keep in mind. The head of the body, according to Colossians 1.18, is Christ. And therefore, the body does what he says. He's not, you know, at our beck and call to do what we say. Yeah, that's right. You know, our goal is to subjugate our lives to his will. And in Colossians 3, in Colossians 3.17, when Paul said, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of. That means do it by his authority. Right. Elders are under the authority of Christ, just like the body is under, uh, because they are a part of the body. BJ, another thought, you know, there are a lot of people in the religious world today, they have been taught, and I heard a fella just the other day, uh, if I were to call his name, many people would be familiar with him, but he spent the entirety of his lesson trying to prove that once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is he couldn't prove it. <laughs> and, and, and yet there are people that buy into that doctrine. And so what we're trying to do is encourage people, look, prove it. You know, go to, the, go to the scriptures and make sure what you're practicing is found in scripture. So what do you, what do you, how, how do you counter those who say, well, you know, if somebody falls away, they really never were a Christian to begin with. You know, uh, this idea of approving, it shouldn't terrify us because the truth never fears investigation. Oh. If you have the truth, you're not afraid for people to look at what you're saying because it will stand up. It will meet the test. But when it comes to this idea of, well, that just proves they were never saved to begin with, we hear this. One of my favorite texts to which to go to address that is Revelation chapter 3, because this is written to a church. So I know they're members of the church. Jesus is addressing a group of his followers. You can't say these folks were never member, became members of the church because it even says in Revelation 3, 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? And then he tells them how they you know, need to be watchful and strengthen what remains. And then he says in verse number four, you have a few names in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, and the one who overcomes, verse five, will be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Question, if he doesn't overcome, will he be clothed in white raiment? No. If he doesn't overcome, Instead of his name not being blotted out of the book of life, his name would be blotted out of the book of life. But wait a minute, a name blotted out of the book of life, what does that mean? If the name in the book of life equals salvation, what would blotting it out equal? And who put that name in there in the first place? God is in charge of putting names in and taking names out. Are we going to say oops, that God is going to say, oh, I put that name in, but I guess I really shouldn't. But look at the way they're living now. I guess they duped me. I guess they deceived me, made me think they were saved when really they weren't. I guess I messed up. Mike, that's blasphemy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is blasphemy. And, and you know what, BJ, in connection with that, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, the writer is addressing people that have come out of Judaism, they've obeyed the gospel of Christ. Some were going back to Judaism. Some had already gone back. There was a danger, a real and apparent danger of apostasy. He said to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, the idea is they belong to God. The church belongs to God. And then he said, who are registered in heaven. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're saying right there. Yeah, who put their names in that the registry. The Lord did. So that means when yeah. we obey the gospel, our names are entered into the book. Now, God can remove that name. Right. And, and as you said a moment ago, the, the, the very thought that God would make a mistake, that, that doesn't even square yeah. with divine truth. Peter mentioned in 2 Peter 2 some very clear impossibilities for this idea. Well, that just proves they were never really saved because watch this. 
if after they have escaped, this is 2 Peter 2.20, they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't say if they pretended to escape. He says they actually did escape it. But then what's possible for someone who has escaped the pollutions of the world? They are again entangled therein and overcome. This just proves they were never really... No, he doesn't say that. He says their latter end is worse than at the beginning. Now wait, at the beginning they were lost, but then they were saved because they escaped. But now they're worse than they were at the beginning. So a saved person has become worse than they were before they were even saved. They're lost with the re eternal regret of I was once saved and look what I gave away. And back up to verse 15 when he says, they have forsaken the right way. Right. Who's he writing to there? <laughs> and then follow that up with verse 21. It had been better for them not to have known. He doesn't say they never knew. He says it would have been better if they hadn't known right. the way of righteousness than after they've known it. He says they did know it. That's right. To turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, and then this is ungetaroundable. It's happened to them like the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed. Well, was the sow washed or not? Well, the sow is dirty again. I guess that proves they were never really cleansed in the first place. Come on. We know better than that. That's right. The sow was washed, but then returned to wallowing in the mire. These people had been washed in the blood of Christ and had been cleansed. They'd escaped the pollutions, but they'd gone back to the muck and mire of sin, and their situation is now worse than before. And you know what, B.J., that is a tremendous commentary on Revelation chapter 3 that you read a moment ago with regard to the church at Sardis. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, again, we said this last program, the Bible is its own best commentary. BJ, I know a lot of people appeal to John 10, and people want to go there and say, well, you know, in John 10, Jesus said that I give them eternal life, verse 28, they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them or pluck them out of my hand. And they want to say, okay, this verse right here undeniably proves once saved, always saved. If people would read carefully, they would see the sheep of verse 27 are the sheep who are promised what's promised in verse 28. Who are the sheep of verse 27? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Sheep that hear the voice of God and follow it are the sheep promised eternal life and are promised that they'll never perish. I can promise you this, Mark. Mike, no one, no one, mark it down. No one has ever, ever perished because they were following Christ and hearing his voice and doing what That's he it. said. And that's all that's being said here. The sheep that will listen to the Christ and follow him will never perish. He'll never lead them in the wrong path. But so this is not talking about a sheep that goes astray. This is talking about sheep that hear his voice and don't go astray. They exactly. keep following. Yeah, go back to John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews, if you abide in my word, mm -hmm. okay, what? You are my disciples indeed. Turn over to John 15. In John 15, Jesus talks about being the vine. He said, we're the branches. But note if you would in verse 4, he said, Abide in me, I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And the point, and matter of fact, I would encourage those who are watching, go back and just note the number of times Jesus stresses this idea of abiding in him. Why? Because there's significance there. And as you said in John 15, if you don't abide in him, consequences. Yeah. When it says you'll be going to cast and burn, is that a pr promise of salvation there? No, it's not. And I'll tell you, Luke 15 also f comes to my mind because he talks about sheep that have gone astray. Let me ask you, in Luke 15, did the sheep that wandered away need to be found? He said it was lost. Oh, it's found. But then it's found. Does that mean it was never lost in the first place? Look at the prodigal son. He was lost, but now it's found. Would it have been better for the prodigal to remain where he was? Would he have been fine if the prodigal had never come home? Would we be able to say what the father says, this my son was lost. He comes right out and says, this, this my son was lost. He was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. Well, was he lost or not? Yes, he was. And B.J., in 1 John chapter 2, you remember in verse 28, Jesus said, And now, little children, abide in him. Yep. Why? Why, John? 
that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Verse 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness yeah. is born of him. Again, that idea of abiding in his word. I'm so glad you read that verse because we don't believe the doctrine of once saved, never quite sure thereafter. We don't believe that. That's right. The word confidence there is available to everyone. We can live in confidence that God is going to save us based on his grace and goodness and our willingness to respond in obedience. But that's different than saying it's impossible to fall away. You can fall, but you don't have to. You don't have to. If you'll keep following his word, hearing his voice, and keep doing what he says, then you can be just as confident as Paul was when he says, I know that there's a crown of life that awaits me. I know this. Paul, are you arrogant? No, I just know God keeps his promises. That's right. And that I've been faithful to follow him. So we're not saying that we have to sing blessed assurance with our fingers crossed, as one person put it. We're singing, we're saying that we have to continue to examine ourselves. One of the greatest Christians that ever lived said, I buffet my body and keep it in subjection, lest by any means after I preach to others, I myself should be cast away. Whoa, whoa, who said that? Paul. And Paul's saying he could be rejected. That's what the word cast away. Paul thought it was possible for even him to be rejected, and that's why he was so careful to make sure that he kept things in check. If Paul could possibly be rejected, who do I think I am that I couldn't be? And yet that very same person was confident in his salvation, saying in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in right. the very face of death, right. there's, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. BJ, I know our time's almost gone. I've got about a minute and a half or so. What would a person need to do based on what the Bible teaches to become a child of God, nothing more, nothing less? Since we just mentioned Paul, Saul of Tarsus did not yet believe Jesus was the Christ until he saw him on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. Was he saved the moment he saw him? No, he was told to go into the city and there he would be told what he must do. So we watch him. He gets up, he goes, he prays, he won't eat, he won't drink. He is so anguished. He's not yet saved. If he were saved, he were the most miserable man who's been saved there ever could be. So he's waiting for a preacher. Ananias is told to go find the praying man, Acts 9-11, and talk to him. He doesn't tell the praying man, stay right there and pray this prayer. He says, get up and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts twenty two sixteen. As a penitent confessing believer, that's what Paul did. Saul of Tarsus became a Christian and was added to the body. And that passage I mentioned a moment ago from 1 Corinthians nine twenty seven. this great Christian still was diligent to make sure that he would keep himself in check lest he be rejected. And then he went right into a reminder of 1 Corinthians 10, how Israelites fell. And then he says, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Fortunately, we don't have to live in fear. We can live in faith and know that someday we get to go be with Jesus. So true, so true. BJ, well said, and thank you very much. Thank you very much.